Moving on to the next session. So this is the last session of the day. It's uh, innovation in extreme environments, in extreme situations. And uh, we are uh, very lucky that we have uh, uh, um, Robin Vincent Smith uh, here with us. Also having a very rounded sort of uh, profile, uh, having studied modern languages, having been involved in tuberculosis and logistics uh, in training, and uh, currently involved in Brussels uh, in order to be able to help uh, change proje uh, projects move forward and, and for them to be completed in a successful manner. So I'm pretty sure he will be successful here too. Vince, uh, Robin, please go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. Last session of the day. Uh, we're going to try and make it a bit more exciting, a bit more Pepsi uh, and uh, show off uh, and have fun uh, and keep your attention before the beer is arriving in, in half an hour or so. Why, uh, why extreme? Why do we call this the extreme session? Because all of the environments in which people have done the innovation have been extreme. Uh, so in terms of Papua New Guinea, where we had the uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, that's because of the access. It's one of the most inaccessible places on Earth. Uh, really, it's very, very difficult to get to, very long time to get there. Uh, why Niger, uh, where we had the, uh, the boreholes, which we'll, we'll see coming up. Uh, it's very hot in Niger, uh, and uh, also there were serious security constraints, and so there was difficulties with access in terms of security as well. And finally, the Ebola context, well, I think it's pretty obvious, but it's the infection control. Very, very strict infection control procedures I mean it's very, very difficult uh, to access uh, the inside of the high-risk zone of the Ebola treatment centers. Uh, but on, on, on a lighter note, um, this had consequences for the footwear of the, uh, the people presenting. Uh, so, uh, for example, jean his, his flip-flops actually melted in Niger uh, while he was sitting in the truck uh, in the Bohan. Uh, Ivan, uh, his flip-flops also melted in the chlorine solution that, that was used to clean. Uh, well, and I think it's probably safe to say that Eric and Isaac lost their flip-flops in the mud uh, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, but you can see uh, behind us a photo <laughs> taken from that. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Eric and Isaac uh, from the desk in, uh, in, in uh, Tokyo uh, to present. And... Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, it's um, not easy for some of us who are not used to this kind of forum to present. And so in order to encourage them and help them, a huge cheer and round of applause, please, for <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. We needed that. That's why we are a tag team. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we're going to present to, to you a project, a pilot project we did in Papua New Guinea on the use of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles in the transport of uh, TB transport specimen for, from peripheral health facilities to a central diagnostic uh, lab. Uh, it's a tag team presentation. I'm presenting with my colleague. Hi, I'm Eric, and I'm uh, the program manager for the desk in, uh, in Tokyo. Sorry for my very thick fresh French accent. <laughs> I'm Isaac, I'm the deputy program manager for the desk in Tokyo. So just a background for those who don't know where Papua New Guinea is. It's uh, just uh, north of Australia. They are separated by the Torres Straits. Uh, it's a country of 7 million people across uh, uh, different uh, islands. 80% of the population is uh, largely rural in very remote uh, areas, not easily accessible. There's more than 800 different ethnic groups, so each village is a different ethnic group, sometimes with different languages. Uh, we have been in uh, Papua New Guinea since 1993, doing different uh, things, but we moved into tuberculosis uh, in May last year with the first project in Gulf Province, which is highlighted in yellow. Is that yellow, orange? And uh, just a few months ago, we opened the new project in the capital district, national capital district, that small little red dot there. So PNG has uh, some of the highest TB incidences in the world, so with uh, an estimated 25,000 new cases uh, every year. If you are to compare it with the famous 22 high burden countries, it's not a high burden country, but in terms of uh, incidence and prevalence, you can see where it would be on the on the world map. Uh, it's the third cause of morbidity in the country and mortality. But the, I mean, the HIV rates are not that high, so the HIV TB co-infection is only 10%. There's been an increase in the number of drug-resistant TB cases, uh, which are estimated to be 5% of new cases and 23% of uh, retreatment cases. One key characteristic of the national TB program in Papua New Guinea is the amazingly poor uh, program outcomes with uh, loss to follow-up rates going as high as 90% in some health facilities. So patients just disappear. 
So we have a project where we work closely with the uh, National TB uh, program in Papua New Guinea. Uh, so we will talk about the Karima project the, in Gulf province because it's the rural uh, project where we have the challenges. So it's, uh, the project is set up with the central hub at uh, the provincial hospital where we do TB diagnosis and management. And then we have a decentralized team that follows up the patients in the, in the peripheral health facilities, either directly through community treatment supporters or through the peripheral health facility uh, medical staff. Since we started, we've had an enrollment of about 50 TB patients per month. Uh, one key characteristic is that uh, more than 25% of the patients are children. The youngest patient we had with drug-resistant TB was only 18 months old. 75% uh, of the patients are new cases, but already we have lost uh, maybe 60% of them. They just disappear into the community after a couple of weeks of treatment. What are the main challenges we are facing, in fact? You have two things at the Gulf province. There is only one road between Port Moresby to Kerema, which is the capital of the province, and after you're in the biggest swamp of the world. So access is very, very difficult. There is, uh, on top of that, to access to different locations, you have to use boats. But unfortunately, the sea is very bad for several months per year. So it's also limiting our capacities to reach, to reach the places. We are thinking about dropping teams for weeks or months there, just to be able to perform their work. So it pushed us to be innovative and to, uh, and to find a solution to be able to bring diagnostic sample to our laboratory. For that, it's really a logistic and a medical, medical work. It came from a medical request, is how to move tuberculosis diagnostic sample from a remote health center to MSF laboratory in the shortest time possible. We, of course, from the logistic side, some prerequisites. System to be easy to use, able to work all season and robust enough to face difficult weather condition, and something safe to be able to transport tuberculosis sample. We are thinking that it's, uh, it can be contaminating sample. For that, we have been in touch with a company called Maternet. It's an American company based in California. They made some tests in IT in 2012. And uh, their technique is relatively simple. It's a quadrupter, uh, so four rotors uh, UAV with an electrical system that go up to 28 kilometers so far and that you can uh, manage through a cell phone. We'll show you a short video about the, uh, the test we, uh, we did. After months of rain, many of the track roads around Kurema have turned into deep clay mud. But neither the sea, too dangerous, nor the rivers, infested with crocodiles, offer feasible alternatives. In such conditions, how can we reach out to remote communities and people who may be suffering from tuberculosis? MSF decided to trial an innovative approach and used unmanned aerial vehicles to send sputum tests for diagnosing TB to Karema Hospital. The impact is to improve considerably and drastically the, um, the diagnostic capacity to be able to react quickly and to have a clear idea of what is the situation for the person even if she is or he is in a remote place far from any referral hospital. It's very new and it could be a real revolution for us in terms of um, effectiveness of diagnostic and, uh, and system. The use of UAVs is still in its trial phase. Operated using a smartphone, they are currently capable of traveling at a speed of 60 kilometers an hour with a range of 28 kilometers. The MSF team also works in Karema Hospital. The aim is to establish within five years an effective model of care adapted to the context that can then be replicated in other affected areas in the country. So in terms of, uh, term of result of this trial phase, the first thing that has been very good is that the uh, health authorities and the civil aviation of Papua New Guinea were really supportive. So it's quite a good thing and they allowed us to make this kind of, uh, of phase. <clears throat> in terms of feasibility test, we managed to uh, move until 500 gram payload 
and with a good resistance to wind up to 36 kilometers, which is not bad for this kind of very light, uh, light equipment. And we got a very good acceptance from, uh, from the population. We managed to make one, uh, one very successful uh, test in between one health center and, uh, and Kerema with, of course, a dummy, uh, dummy payload, but we, uh, we managed to, uh, to make it, and we are supposed to go four hours by car. We make it in one hour by drone. So the technology is quite interesting. But so far, our problem is that the, the short is a, it's a short range. Uh, it needs still human action to swap batteries, and it's not a complete mature uh, technology. Uh, the picture there really sums up the reactions we got from the community. <laughs> You've got all the possible range of emotions you can get when you see a drone flying above you. <laughs> so we've got excitement, we've got fear, and we have amazement. So there's still some question from internal question and external question. In fact, the internal is MSF is, it, is able or not to handle this kind of technology. Are we able to uh, deploy it on a, on a field? And uh, are we able to afford it because it's quite expensive? The external question is what will be the acceptance of the population and what will be the authorization we can get to use this kind of technology in other countries? Where are we now? Today we are still in contact with, uh, with Maternet but also with other companies who are working on this technology. And hopefully we'll make another test uh, this year with uh, or Maternet or other, uh, other companies who are working with us on this, uh, on this topic. Finally, just to, to acknowledge everyone who was involved, the Papua New Guinea authorities for allowing us to do this, the Maternet for bringing the technology. They actually had their team in the field for two weeks. They could, what we briefed them is totally different from what they saw on the ground. Now they appreciate what we do and also the MSF teams that were involved in the field. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much. So questions, questions. So here we have number one question uh, at the bottom and number two question. Uh, you said it's quite expensive. How does it compare to the cost of sending a very small sample vial via a car with staff over really rough roads, it's going to cost to maintain the car and so on and so forth. I mean, do you end up actually saving even if it's expensive? We, we didn't do the, uh, the comparative cost uh, for a couple of reasons. That's was we were only speaking about the trial phase. So uh, that's one of the, uh, the facts. After, to compare the time of uh, one hour by drone and the four hours by car with the risk of accident, the risk of, uh, of not accessing to the place, it's it's not only the cost, it's also uh, the time we can save and how easy it can be for us after. And also, just to add that uh, in Papua New Guinea, as Eric said, the only road, there's only one road that's from the, uh, from the capital district to the hospital. After the rest of the province, you walk for five days or you use boats and half the year, there's no access. So there's probably no other option. We can't compare with cars because... <laughs> I have a very short, yeah. I have a very short question. I hope I did did not miss it during the presentation. How high can they fly the drones? Because I was wondering, you were saying the uh, it was well accepted by the population, but I don't know if you can grasp them or they are too no, high or no, it's, it's <laughs> because it might it looks like a toy maybe also for some. I don't know how big it is, but it seems to be small and light. It's, it's relatively small, but it flies uh, several meters above, uh, above the ground. Huh? It's, uh, it's not accessible. You cannot get it uh, when it's flying. So, uh, but several so meters is how much? 100 or 200? Uh, if I well remember, it's around 100 meters. OK. Thank you. And it adjusts uh, with the terrain. So if it goes uh, in a mountain region, it goes 100 meters above the, the mountain. Sorry, I, I would like to add one more question <laughs> as an anthropologist. How did you? Uh, uh, check on the acceptance of the population. Uh, in fact, it has been very basic. Is that uh, in Kerema there is one football field, and uh, we invited the population of the city to come and we made a demonstration about uh, about the technology. So where you have the picture of the three kids, it was exactly uh, during the time of the presentation. So we made it very clear about what was what has been our purpose and why we are using it. 
And people understand it because, to be honest, we lost a couple of them in the jungle. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them was bring back by the, by the population saying, oh, I think you lost that. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. The last question here down at the front. Yes, uh, very exciting uh, work. What uh, have you uh, come across in terms of uh, application of this technology for uh, refugee camps, for assessing population numbers, for assisting with the mapping that we heard of earlier this morning? It would, have, with uh, proper GPS and cameras, one could imagine this would have multiple uses for MSF. I should say for, for us, it's, it's really it's two different topics. Uh, there is the mapping, which is, uh, which is run by some of our colleagues, and there is the transportation part. So it's really uh, two different topics, and the type of uh, UAVs is completely different. Because us, we need UAVs that are able to take off and to land, and logically, for, uh, for mapping, you just need something to fly above and to land back to your, uh, to your official area. So it's, uh, it's making the difference in terms of technology and in terms of what we want to achieve. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Eric, go ahead.